the problems that occur with success. Nobody ever talked about that before. Mm. All we talk about is what's great about success. We don't talk about the baggage that comes with success. Yeah. With success comes a lot of challenges. And I talk about what do successful people do wrong? Nobody talked about that. All I talk about is what they do right. I talked about problems that come with success and what leaders need to stop. So I think the book is very unique in that sense. Also, the book has the world's best title. What got you here won't get you there. It's a killer title. I get I do Google search, so I, I find out every time someone uses that quote. Every day people use that quote. It's so good. So I've heard it in business, they're not actually putting the two together with the book. I think about it from the business capacity. Okay, I'm here in business now, but what got me here won't get me to the next stage. Right. It means the same thing, but it's a different aspect when you're putting it into Mine is it. on the leadership dimension, yeah. predominantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome to the Kelly Lumber Podcast, Marshall. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And you traveled all the way from the USA. You came from Nashville. I came from Nashville to New Orleans to New York City through Dubai to Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Riyadh, Abu Dhabi and here. Wow, so we were last on the stop. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm moving along. And how long have you been away for? Uh, this is a three-week trip. Wow. So what brings you on this trip in particular? Well, I'm really focusing more on my new AI computer bot. So I'm talking a lot about that. It's very exciting. I've got some very nice people who are sponsoring it in India. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have my own AI bot, which is sort of cool. I can't wait to get into it. So actually, I know we are. Let's kind of take people from back to the beginning, because I say back to the beginning in the sense of I read your books years and years and years ago, and I've since read your more recent one that's come out there in life. I'm so happy to be sitting here and talking about um, the things that you've achieved and the stories and the lessons that you've done. Can you tell people who maybe haven't heard of your books or know who you are and what it is that you do? What is it and how do you help people? Well, you know, I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. I went to a little engineering school in Indiana. I was almost thrown out three times, made five Ds, barely graduated. But last year, I went back and gave the commencement address. I love that. Honorary PhD. <laughs> the first thing I said is, let's hear it for the bottom of the class here. You never know. After that, I got an MBA at Indiana and a PhD at UCLA, and I was college professor and dean. And since then, I do three things. I travel all about the world speaking and teaching, so I've been to 102 countries. Uh, and um, I had a home over here for a while in Dubai. I yeah. lived in a very small building, the Burj Khalifa. So I don't oh, know if you know. It's hard, a, hard that's to That's a find. hardship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if people have heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little place. And then, um, then I like speaking and teaching. And then I'm most famous for being an executive coach. So I yeah. coach five people who have been considered a CEO of the year in the United States and the head of the World Bank and the Mayo Clinic and on and on and on. And, you know, ministers in Saudi Arabia, people all around the world. And then I write books and articles, so I've written or edited 55 books, and I've done eight bestsellers and four New York Times bestsellers, and 47 books purchased only by my mother, my father, and my <laughs> So most of them nobody bought, but three or four million people bought a few of them. I so should that tell my parents they need to buy more of my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it. anyway, so that's what I do and uh, very, very exciting. What got you into the coaching space then? You know, when did that happen and how did it all start? Well, I'll tell you, I got into the leadership development space. I know your audience. One thing I'd say is hang out with great people. Yeah. That's a key. I met a very famous man at the time named Dr. Paul Hersey, and he and Ken Blanchard invented something called situational leadership. And I got to go to the guy's class and say, man, that guy's good. I want to be like him when I grow up. So I served coffee and sat in the back and moved tables and just did whatever I could do to sit in the class. And one day he got double booked. He said, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I need help. Can you do it? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay a thousand bucks for a day. I was making $15,000 a year. He offered me a thousand bucks a day. Yeah. That was 47 years ago. That's a lot of money to a poor kid, right? He said, I'll try. I did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. They were so angry when I showed up because it wasn't him. <laughs> but I got ranked first place of all the speakers. Yeah, I'm funny, telling jokes, stories. Those were boring. They say, we love this guy. Bring him again. And that's how I got into the leadership development business. And coaching, the same thing. There was nothing called coaching. I just made it up. I talked to this guy as a CEO. He said, I got this kid working for us. Young, smart, dedicated, hardworking jerk. He said, he'd be worth a fortune to me if you could change this kid's behavior. I said, remember the last time? I like fortunes. Maybe I can help him. He said, I doubt it. I came up with an idea. So I'll work with the kid for a year. If he gets better, pay me. If he don't get better, it's free. You know what he said? sold. There was nothing called coaching. 
I just made that up. I want to know what happened to the kid then. He so, got better. And then the, and what, how did you come up with a the payment then? What happened then? It was very simple. I got paid. And I said, if he gets better, is it worth this money? The guy said, yes. I said, he gets better, pay me. I love that. Yeah. And it was better wasn't judged by him. It's judged mm. by everyone around him. Yeah. And going all in on that space. So then that took you into the, the coaching space again, working one-on-one -on -one with clients. And yes, then sir. when did the first book come out? Well, I've done many edited books. The first book I did was an edited book called The Leader of the Future. Mm -hmm. And it was a, another great point for everyone listening. It was Peter Drucker, Francis L. Spun, Richard Beckard, and me. Now, who was I? I was nobody compared to these people. Yet, once we did six books together, I was kind of one of them. Hanging yourself hanging out, around the... Hanging out with great people. And I got to meet Peter Drucker, who's the founder of Modern Management. And that was my edited book. It sold half a million copies, the first yeah. one. Then my big book is called What Got You Here, Won't You There? What happened is the New Yorker magazine wrote the story of my life. So in this story, it was a fantastic story. It's funny. And my friend read the story. And he calls me up and he said, you know, look, I read that thing. That's fantastic. And he said, I've read what you've written. It's not that good. I said, well, no kidding. Some woman from the New Yorker magazine can write better than me. Duh. <laughs> he said, why don't we write a book that sounds like that? I said, we can do it. Let's do it. He's my agent and co-author. His name is Mark Ryder. And the book was What Got You Here, Won't Get You There. And That was the, the star of that It's a mega book. book. It's yeah. still selling. And, you know, we had a $100,000 royalty check on that book two months ago for six months of royalty, 17 years after the book came out. So that book just is unbelievably successful. Why has the content not dated then in that way? Because, you know, with so many pieces, it's still there. What is it that you think makes it so relevant still now? I think it's just very basic human behavior. Yeah. And what happens is I talk about the problems that occur with success. Nobody ever talked about that before. Mm. All we talk about is what's great about success. We don't talk about the baggage that comes with success. Yeah. With success comes a lot of challenges. And I talk about what do successful people do wrong? Nobody talked about that. All I talked about is what they do right. I talked about problems that come with success and what leaders need to stop. So I think the book is very unique in that sense. Also, the book has the world's best title. What got you here won't get you there. It's a killer title. It gets, I, I get, I do Google search. So I, I find out every time someone uses that quote, every day people use that quote. It's so good. So I've heard it in business, they're not actually putting the two together with the book. Yeah. Whereas I've been, I, I think about it from the business capacity. Okay, I'm here in business now, but what got me here won't get me to the next stage. Right. Whereas the principle's there, but it's slightly different. Right. It means the same thing, but it's a different aspect when you're putting it into Mine is it. on the leadership dimension, yeah. predominantly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we've gone from book writing. Did you ever see yourself as an author? I was brought up poor. Uh, my high school ranked next to last place in Kentucky in academic achievement. My elementary school, that was called an outhouse. We didn't have indoor plumbing. Wow. Uh, so... Yeah, did I see myself as a New York Times bestselling author? <laughs> not <Never>. really, no. <laughs> I it think, wasn't it, there in no, the career no, no. options. <laughs> that was not crossing my radar screen yeah. particularly. That was not the number one career occupation for kids where I was brought up. Yeah. Your last one that I wanted to touch on, which was one you did last year, yeah. The Earned Life. How's that going down? Uh, well, I love that book. That yeah. book is also a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. And that book is very fascinating. It talks a lot more. It's more a book about life. Uh, what got you here, won't you there, is more a book about leadership and the people I've coached and the successful th challenges they have. Your in life is really more a book about life itself and mm -hmm. how to live a good life. And so, yeah, I love the book. You have a, a chapter in the book where you talk about people have to go out and, and prove themselves and it's the credibility. There was that line where you'd said credibility needs to be earned twice. And I absolutely love this in the personal branding space. Can you elaborate a little bit more well, on that? I think this is perfect for your audience. My book, What Got You Here, Won't You There, is about the people I coach. Mm -hmm. And their problems tend to be what I call overselling. You know, they promote themselves too much. They win all the time. They're trying to be right. They've already won. I tell them, quit winning. Quit being right all the time. You don't have to promote yourself anymore. You already won. Most coaches have the opposite problem. I've done surveys with coaches. Do you tend to oversell? overpromote yourself or undersell. The huge majority, 88%, say they undersell. Absolutely. Now, all of you coaches who are listening to me right now, are you consultants, ready for some coaching? I'm yeah. giving coaching to all the coaches. Are I love you, it. <laughs> are you ready? 
Question one, Peter Drucker said, our mission in life is to make the world a better place, not to prove we're smart, not to prove we're right. Question one for all the coaches listening, if you became more powerful and influential, would the world be a better place? 95% say yes, I've yep. done the survey. Love it. 95% say yes. Question two, does trying to become more powerful and influential make you feel uncomfortable? Ooh, uncomfortable. The huge majority of coaches say it makes them uncomfortable and they do not promote themselves very much. The hard question, number three, what's more important to you in life? Making the world a better place or being comfortable? Love that. Yeah, being comfortable or making the world, well, get over it. What is this? And by the way, this nonsense. You ever hear this phrase, my good work should speak for itself? Oh, I hear that a lot. <laughs> it's nonsense. Your good work doesn't speak for itself. Mm. Yeah, your good work. God's not going to fly out of the sky and recognize you for your good work. Now, we talked about books. Let me give this as an example. Yeah. A woman from Amazon just talked to me a few hours ago. How many titles are on Amazon.com? Answer, 44 million titles, 44 wow. million. How many do you have to sell in one year to be in the top half of all books sold? And the answer is two. <laughs> half of them sold zero to one copy. Doesn't mean they're bad books. Yeah. I am not arrogant enough to believe that my books are better than 22 million other books. Yeah. Some of those books have to be fantastic, just statistically. Nobody bought them. Mm. Credibility must be heard twice. One part of credibility is you write a great book. Two, somebody buys it. For the people listening to me right now, I know these people. They're good people. They want to do good. They've got good hearts. Part of credibility is doing a good job. They probably spend a lot of time trying to do a good job. The other part is being recognized for doing a good job. Mm. Coaches tend to be awful at that. Mm. They tend to be all, and if you think about it in a way, it's almost arrogant. My good work should speak for itself. You don't yeah, have to true. sell. I didn't actually think about it in the yeah, other way. It's ridiculous. Mm. No company would have a marketing function. Yeah, it's so true. So that part I absolutely loved as well. The other book that I have read of yours was, um, which I think you co-authored with... Sally Hogeson? Yes, I was. Thank you. Yes. Women who, How Women Rise. How Women Rise. I love that book. How did that come about? Well, that book is the number one best-selling book for women in leadership in the world in the last five years. That book is a killer book. Mm -hmm. Now, I can brag about this because I didn't write that book. By the way, I didn't write any of my... Those top five books, I didn't write any of them. Uh, what Got You Here and What You Here was actually written by my friend Mark Ryder. His name is on the cover there, Mark Ryder. I just have the ideas. Mm. And then he writes the book. Okay. So we have a partnership. He's my agent and co-author. I have the ideas. He writes the book. How Women Rise, I did with Sally Hogeson. Sally's world's expert on women in leadership. I had a 15% contribution to the book, maybe. She would maybe 85% her. She wrote the book herself. She's a good writer. Yeah, yeah. I'm very proud of that book. In that book, we talk about kind of the opposite problems of the people I coach. People that don't promote themselves enough. Mm -hmm. People that need to reach out more. Uh, people that worry too much. So that was a great, great book. And again, very proud. One thing I'm so proud of with that book, no negative political feedback in America from the right wing or the left wing. <laughs> That's almost impossible I, yeah. for a book about women and leadership. We spent hours yeah. working on that book so it wouldn't offend people. Wow. It's great. I'm very proud of it. Yeah, awesome. So in this space, I think we've, we've touched on, you know, the coaching, we've got books, the credibility, you've got to put yourself out there. I know sort of my listeners listening or watching, one of the things that they want to do is they want to speak more. They want to help more people. Right. As part of your journey in the coaching space, was that something you've consciously done? Or oh, is it the, yes. Yeah, okay. There was a group called Linkage. It's now owned by SHRM. They have very fancy people give speeches. How much money did I get paid for my first speech with them? Do you know how much money I got paid? Minus 17,000 bucks. I paid them $17,000 so I could get my picture on the brochure and be one of those famous people speaking. Credibility. Credibility. Wow. 
Yeah. So part of your journey, you put yourself out there, you paid for some of the opportunities to be seen as that person that was credible all those years ago. Then what happened? People then saw you and then booked you or? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have to pay anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're still not in debt. <laughs> <laughs> they pay me now. It's, That's good. It's That's much good. nicer. It's Absolutely. Much nicer. The other thing is, though, you have to pay your dues. Mm. You just have to pay your dues and you don't start at the top. You have to work. Yeah. It's hard. Building credibility is hard. LinkedIn. I have 1.5 million followers. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Nobody pays you for that. They pat on you on the head every second. If you want to get the message out there, though, you want to be well known, you have to pay for it. You have to work hard. Mm. What do you think the, the tips you could give, a couple of tips to someone who's kind of starting out in that career going, wow, okay, what are some of the things I need to do that work really well? Very good question. Number one, have a unique brand. Now, my area of expertise is I help successful leaders achieve positive long-term change in behavior. Doesn't sound that big of a deal. When I started, nobody did that. Do a Google search, helping successful leaders in quotes. The first 500 references, 450 are me. Wow. The entire rest of the world is 50. That's a brand. Mm -hmm. Who's the world's authority on helping successful leaders achieve positive change in behavior? That would be me. Now, who's second place? Somebody. Mm. <laughs> I could rank number one executive coach in the world for years. Yeah. Well, why? I tried. So part of our advice for coaches is build your brand. Now, shall I give your coaches the best advice ever for being seen as a great coach? Love it. They've never thought about this, is my guess. In my coaching for years, I didn't get paid if my clients didn't get better. The client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all, and he did not get paid. The client I spent the least amount of time with improved more than anyone I've ever coached. 200 people got better, and I did get paid. Humbling lesson. I made a chart on one dimension. It was called time spent with me. The other dimension was called improvement. There was a negative correlation between spending time with me and improving. <laughs> I thought, well, this is a humbling chart. I go talk to my friend who improved the most who was fantastic to start with. His name is Alan Mulally. Alan was CEO of the year in the United States. He went to Ford. The stock was 101. He left it was 1840. He had a 97% approval rating as a CEO from every employee in a union company. Unheard of. He's an amazing leader. Wow. I talked to my friend Alan. We're writing a book together now. I said, Alan, of all the people I coach, you improved the most. And I spent the least amount of time coaching you. I showed Alan my chart. I said, Alan, the way this chart looks and you never met me, you would have been even better. <laughs> so I asked Alan, what should I learn about coaching for you, from you? He taught me two lessons. Everyone listen, learn these lessons, and this is a good use of your time. He said, number one, as a coach, your biggest challenge is called customer selection. If you work with great, dedicated, hardworking people, you win. You work with people who don't care, you lose. Mm -hmm. Two, never make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how great you think you are. Make it about the great people you work with and how proud you are of them. That changed my life. I get ranked number one coach in the world forever. Why? Nobody knows I'm a good coach. I can't say I'm the best coach in the world. Who knows? I can say one thing. I have the best clients in the world. Mm, I love that. Love it, love it, love it. The best so my clients. advice to the coaches is sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Mm. But to the degree possible, don't take bad business. Don't work with people that don't care. They're not going to get better anyway. Yeah. Something... I, I've got a test. So you're about to get married, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I ask people, have you ever tried to change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner that had no interest in changing? <laughs> I think we can all, we can all see something there. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and then I ask, even worse, how many of you are still to change mommy and daddy that don't want to change? Oh, how's that? Oh, look at your guilty face. <laughs> how's that working out for you, right? I was teaching my class at, uh, at uh, Johnson & Johnson. A woman raised her hand. I said, are you trying to change mommy or daddy? She said, daddy. I said, what's daddy's problem? She said, he does not have a healthy lifestyle. So I asked her, uh, how old is daddy? She said, 94 years old. <laughs> Leave the old boy alone. Oh. Now, great lesson for the coaches. If they don't care, 
Let it go. Don't waste your time. They're not going to get better. Yeah, say if you no. have to do, if you have to take the business to, you, you need the money. You need the money. I understand that. Mm. If you don't have to, if you don't need the money, don't take bad business. And I remember the first time I said no to a client. I say no clients all the time. Yeah, and it was the first time. It was like I was. Why, why am I saying no? Because it didn't feel right. They weren't the right client for me. But then there was a so much empowerment and actually being able to say no. I'm not doing this. Oh, I have a great story. Back in the old days, Jack Welch was the CEO of GE. Yeah. So they wanted me to coach one of his direct reports as division president. I said, I will work with this guy if he gets confidential feedback, if he apologizes, if he does all this stuff. He called back, he wants to work with you. He doesn't want to do this stuff. I said, no, I'm not going to work with him. I only get paid for results. Forget it. They call again. Forget the pay for results. We'll just give you the money. I said, no, I, I'm not going to work with that. They said, you can't tell us that. Where the customer said, wrong again. Customers send me money. I don't want your money. You are not my customer. He said, you can't say that. I said, in America, we have this freedom of speech clause. Yes, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This goes right up to Jack Welch, who was CFGE. Jack Welch says, we can't even pay this coach guy to work for him? Why not? Well, he didn't want to do this. Jack, you know what Jack Welch said? I can't pay this guy to coach you. You think I'm going to waste my time with this clown? Fired. <laughs> Fired the guy. And did they? Oh, and they were... Three of the top people in that division thanked him immediately and said, what took you so long? They called me and said, thank you after that. Thank you wow. for having the guts to stand up and say no. That's a big lesson, a yeah. big lesson. Okay, let's touch on ego a little bit because I think there's something in that. that yes. One, having the confidence, but then the ego that other people drive with in businesses and stuff. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences with that? And and you've, you've talked about it in your books before as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's most of what I deal with. Yeah. At the top, 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 number one problem is winning too much. Mm. What's that? I was entering Harvard Business Review. What's the number one problem? Winning too much. What does that mean? It's important we want to win. Meaningful we want to win. Critical we want to win. And trivial we want to win anyway. They're just winners. Winners love winning. Yeah. So I give my clients a case study. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, or partner wants to go to dinner at Y. You have an argument. You go to Y. The food tastes awful and the service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided if you listen to me, 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 me. Option B, shut up. Eat the dumb food. Try to enjoy it and have a nice night. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. <laughs> Second case study. You have a hard day at work. You come home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there, and the other person says, well, I had a, such a hard day today. I had such a tough day. And we reply, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. You know what I had to put up with today? We're so competitive, we have to prove we're more miserable than the people we live with. <laughs> I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. A young guy raised his hand. He says, I did that last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I know that you're here as part of a big tour for the Marshall Bot, and I want to talk about that in just a minute. But there was something that I was curious when I was doing some research, and I was looking at videos, and you're always wearing a green T-shirt. And ta-da, you're here in a green T-shirt today. Do you always wear a green T-shirt? Is this part of your brand? Well, you know, that's uh, the New Yorker magazine years ago wrote the story of my life. It was a wonderful profile authored by Larissa McFarquhar. In the profile, Larissa noted that I always wore a green polo shirt. I didn't actually always wear a green polo shirt, but that's what she remembered. Once it was published, people started expecting me to wear a green polo shirt. This was great for me as I don't like to dress up anyway. So now I wear a green polo shirt almost every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that your voice? It's your voice, AI. Just AI. So it's it, an AI it, voice, but this is this is you. Well, this is my AI bot. Let me give you a brief history of it. Yeah. My AI bot is called Marshall Bot. I always wanted to give everything away, and I'm just incredibly fortunate. Four, four things happen. One, I've got a lot of content. So I've fed one and a half million words to this thing. I've been working on this eight or nine months. Okay. Two, I've got a lot of followers. So I've got a million and a half followers on LinkedIn. You need to have followers because if you give everything away, people have to care. Mm. Number three, though, I'm willing to give it away, which is very unusual. And then four, somebody's paying for it. I've got some brilliant, wonderful people. I've got eight engineers working on a company called Fractal AI. And so it is unbelievable. My goal was it would answer any question you ask me as well as me. 
Oh, it's just better than that. So it what can, kind of questions can we ask well, it? Well, any question. It doesn't answer. If you ask it, who's Donald Trump? You know what it says? I don't know. It doesn't answer politics. It uh -huh. doesn't give medical advice. It doesn't give financial advice. Eh, what's a nice question you might ask about life or people or coaching or anything? You can answer anything? Well, you asked me about earlier, you know, credibility. What did I mean by credibility must be earned twice? Yeah. And Yeah, I gave you an answer. On the other hand, let's say that you weren't listening to me in person and you were curious, why did I say credibility must be earned twice? Well, you see, you could ask my little friend here and let's see what my friend might have to say. Credibility must be earned twice because it is not just about doing a great job, but also being known for doing a great job. Doing a great job is important for personal integrity and pride, while being known for doing a great job is important for reputation and career advancement. If one only focuses on doing a great job without promoting themselves or gaining recognition, their credibility may not be fully recognized or appreciated. For example, in the context of women in professional fields, they may work hard and deliver high quality work. But if they do not promote themselves or take credit for their achievements, they may not be considered for promotions or opportunities as much as their male counterparts who are more vocal about their successes. Mm. As an author and executive coach, I understand mm. how important it is to gain credibility. On one hand, I need to write a good book or deliver effective coaching. On the other hand, I need to be recognized as a person who writes good books or is an effective coach. I don't want to write a good book or provide valuable coaching that no one benefits from because they are not aware of it. You're this built on part of the Sally Helgeson book, How yeah. Women Rise Too. Yeah. So all this information is everything that you've put into it. It's absolutely free. Anyone can access it. Oh, it's better than that. Okay. Let me tell you how it's better. That was my original goal. Oh, this is way beyond that. My daughter, Kelly, wanted to trick it. No, my daughter's very smart. She has a PhD from Yale, and she's a professor at Vanderbilt. She's going to trick the bot. She said, okay, Daddy, how is your coaching related to utilitarian philosophy? I don't even know what utilitarian philosophy is. My friend studies the internet, studies utilitarian philosophy, studies my coaching. It knows me, knows how I would respond to these learnings. It answers in a way that I approve of with my voice in five seconds. That's insane. It's mind-blowing. Wow. It is just mind-blowing. Oh, it's way beyond me. I mean, this, people say, can it answer questions as well as you? Oh, it's not close. It's way, way, way better than I am. It can answer questions that I never thought of. Yeah. It will study the question. Oh, I was just in Saudi Arabia. How is your coaching related to Islamic philosophy? It studies Islamic philosophy. It studies my coaching. It answers the question. I was there with people in Saudi Arabia. They know Islamic philosophy. I couldn't believe it. Then I said, but how about this one component of Islamic is philosophy, go into great detail. Oh, it answers the question in great detail. And it's quoting verses from the Quran in the answer. Wow. Now, no offense to me, but I'm not sure I could actually do that. <laughs> no, this thing is mind blowing. Love it. it is really good. I use it with my own coaching. So, how can people access this? You said you're giving it away for free, so yeah. anyone has oh, this. Go to Marshall Goldsmith. All one word, Marshall has two L's, marshallgoldsmith.ai. That's all you have to do. It's free. Now, I've already had people ask it questions, I think, 54,000 times, and we're just getting started. So yeah. hopefully millions of people will be able to answer, ask questions to this thing. And as I said, it is mind-blowing. Now, let me tell you what I love about this. Every computer bot is biased. Mm -hmm. Like the, the one that was Google had a huge blow-up because it was obvious bias, right? Mine is biased. It's biased by me. Let me tell you what I mean by bias. If you answer a question, what is leadership? There are 50 answers. Mm. Once you pick an answer, you're biased. <laughs> That's Whose answer is that? Well, somebody's biased, yeah. right? It's my bias to that answer. Yeah. What I love about this is you know what the bias is. I am the bias. It is answering questions in a way that I approve of. I have an edit function. If I don't like the answer... I throw it out. So this answers questions in a way that is consistent with my thinking in life. It goes way beyond me because yeah. it can study things I don't know anything about. But then it says, wait a minute. 
if he were studying this, how would he respond? And gives almost a perfect answer instantaneously. He's gone home to try it. <laughs> well, it started out in text. As you've heard, it now has the audio. What's coming up next? The video. Ooh. I sent my daughter a sample. Yeah. And I said, I want you to watch this. It's about my new AI project. She watches it for two minutes. And she said, well, that's not about an AI project. That's my father talking about a management thing. After two minutes, she goes, that's not my father. My own daughter, it took her two minutes to know. That was the junior version. Now, the new stuff coming out, no way she doesn't know it's me. She, she's going to think it's me. So it's going to look like me, sound like me, and down the road, be available in multiple languages. You That's could ask clever. it questions in all kinds of different languages, and it, you'll see me up there with a green T-shirt. <laughs> and by the way, it always wears a green T-shirt. It wears a green T-shirt. It looks like me. It sounds like me. You can't tell the difference, and it will answer in multiple languages. I love that. Thank you for coming to share this. And just thank you for coming on the show after so many years of that first reading your book. I never thought we'd be sitting here talking about your journey and, and everything that you shared. So thank you so much for your time and everything that you give to everyone to become that better person. Well, thank you so much. And uh, everybody, just go to marshallgoldsmith.ai. The best thing you can do to help me is use it, and it's free. And by the way, there's no catch. There's no secret door or any of that stuff. No, it's actually free. I love that. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your trip. Thank you so much.